You. Thought you were different. I'm sorry, kid. I'm just a terrible person, I guess. Birds of Prey and the Something Something Harley Quinn is the first DC movie of the new decade. And consequently a chance for DC and Warners to once and for all prove that they have finally fully lifted themselves up from the brown colored swamp they've been consistently drowning in for years. But since this is basically a spin-off of none other than Suicide Squad, I'm sure you can guess the result. <laughs> that was super embarrassing. <laughs> Sure was. Essentially, Birds of Prey is an ensemble movie that chooses to leave out teeny tiny narrative elements like plot in favor of focusing exclusively on its wide-ranging group of eccentric characters as well as this crazy wonky world of Harley Quinn's Gotham City that they inhabit. And even though you already know how I feel about not including a strong plot in movies, just do it! Based on 2019's Joker, I am willing to go with it, assuming that they actually pull off the characters and the world in a magnificent way. And of course, they don't at all. And I gotta be honest, it feels a bit weird to say that, since the one thing this movie does handle exceptionally well is the way it chooses its main sources of inspiration, which here are Captain Jack Sparrow and Deadpool. And listen, if you wanna comment that oh look Phil Mentos just making cool titles again, fair enough, but that's not all it is. Because when I say Birds of Prey takes inspiration from Captain Jack and Deadpool, I'm actually understating it. Because in reality, this movie is basically a straight ripoff of them. And he doesn't even try to hide it. Parlay? Parlay? Hold up, hold up. I'm telling this wolf wrong. Let's rewind. For you to understand why I took a cat nap on 1200 gallons of high test fuel, I need to take you back. With the walls closing in around me, I made a carefully calculated, highly strategic move. Are you dummies still sitting there? Fine. Since you stuck it out this long, I'll tell you a super duper secret secret. The personality of Harley Quinn is a straight copy paste of Jack Sparrow, whereas this wonky world and the narrative used to showcase it is a straight copy paste of Deadpool. And there's nothing wrong with that in of itself. If you're gonna copy something, you might as well copy the proven greats. What is wrong with it, however, is that this movie completely misses the point of what makes those two entities great, which ultimately leads to the destruction of not only the character of Harley Quinn, but but also the other characters and the world around her. AKA, the very things this movie was supposed to get right. And if that wasn't already enough, then there's also one other aspect in here that this problem would have actually helped, but for whatever reason for that, the movie just decides to toss it aside entirely to make sure it doesn't work either. So yeah, let's roller skate into this neon colored Gotham City of something something Harley Quinn to see what exactly went wrong with it. Here's how not to Jack Sparrow and Deadpool. Based on her core personality and traits, the best way to describe Harley Quinn in this movie is that she's basically a female Gotham City equivalent of Captain Jack Sparrow. In that she's this very erratic, seemingly insignificant fool who maneuvers through the obstacles of the world with ease, despite appearing to be content with just living in her own head. Your humble flat. I'll help you at the automat. Pull out of you! Slag and braces! Hi, Captain! Slag and braces! Step lively! Have a will! The only problem is that when the filmmakers try to copy Jack, they completely miss the point of what makes him such a great entertaining character. In other words, they clearly only looked at him as he appears in Pirates 5. <laughs> Firstly, the thing that makes Jack Sparrow a real proper movie hero that audiences can connect with and look up to is the fact that even though he comes off as an insignificant idiot dismissed by others, that's not who he actually is. It's just a way for him to get an edge over others. Which is very positively powerful because it essentially shows the audience that even though other people might look down on you and dismiss you as nothing, that doesn't mean you are nothing. You are without doubt the worst pirate I've ever heard of. Commodore! He's disabled the rudder chain, sir! Abandon shit! That's got to be the best pirate I've ever seen. 
So it would seem. But with Harley Quinn in Birds of Prey, she actually is just an insignificant idiot. When she's being an annoying dumb drunk at a club, it's not because she's trying to present herself that way in order to gain access to some restricted area or something, but just because she's an annoying dumb drunk. When she does bad things to others which leads to them coming after her, it's not because she planned for that to happen for some reason, but just because she does dumb things. When she blows up Joker's HQ, it's not based on any hint of intelligence whatsoever, but instead only on the fact that she's a dumb dumb who does dumb crap when she's drunk. And as we have very clearly seen, that's not the basis for a great character audiences wanna connect with or support. And even if it was, is that really the kind of hero you want your teenage or even younger female audiences to look up to? You are without doubt the worst pirate I've ever heard of. Secondly, speaking of dumb, remember how Jack Sparrow always uses his wits to maneuver himself through obstacles and out of sticky situations? Well, that's not the case with Harley. Whatever obstacles she maneuvers through, whatever sticky situations she gets out of, it's always based on sheer random luck, like she was the DC equivalent of Mr. Magoo. When she's about to be impaled by an arrow, she sees a random pin on the ground and ducks to take it. When she's about to be abducted by some douchebags, another character randomly shows up just in time to save her. Even when we finally do get a hint of Harley using her own wits to survive a tough situation, the movie smashes in in front of us like, no, fine. It was dumb luck. And it baffles me why DC and Warners can't just let Harley be a genuinely witty trickster who overcomes obstacles with her own abilities. Because when the universe just seems to gift her these get out of jail free cards, it just ends up feeling random and thus unearned. And speaking of random, thirdly, you know how Jack is a physical manifestation of motive who always has his own active goals that push the movie forward. Well, that's not the case here, because Harley is one of those dreaded in active passive heroes. For the first 40 minutes, the only motivated goal she has had is to eat a sandwich. How exhilarating. And then ultimately it gets to the point where the movie is just like F it and decides to move things along by itself. In the storytelling business, this dummy swallowing that diamond is called a complication. What Harley calls a complication here is not actually a complication, but instead a convenience. Because since Harley isn't pushing the movie forward with her actions, the movie has to push her forward with these random events. Like when the girl randomly shows up at the right place just at the right time to steal this important MacGuffin diamond that the bad guy needs. But even after that, when the movie finally seems to make Harley active, she still doesn't actually have any goals and motivations of her own. Because because she's either just doing what others tell her to do or she's waiting for someone else to poop out the MacGuffin for her. How exhilarating. I mean, the whole theme of this movie is to show that Harley can have a purpose by herself beyond just being given a purpose by men like the Joker. He is going to be running right back into his arms the minute he snaps his fingers. If not him, the next plus is alpha male with a pulse. Mm -hmm. Some people just aren't born to stand on their own. But then when she actually is without the Joker, she has no purpose whatsoever until another man steps in and gives her one. What a great message. What a great character. All in all, if you want to copy Captain Jack, maybe don't pick the one movie that doesn't actually feature the real Captain Jack. Because this is what happens. As to the way the narrative of this movie is built, with all the edgy fourth wall breaking voiceover and multiple non-chronological timelines and overall ridiculous carefree tone, that's when we enter Deadpool territory, which by itself probably is a great fit for a story like this. Oh. <laughs> There's just one teeny tiny problemo. Whereas Deadpool is a Deadpool movie told from the point of view of Deadpool, Birds of Prey is a Birds of Prey movie told from the point of view of Harley Quinn. The issue of which comes in form of the fact that it kinda ruins every other protagonist character who isn't Harley Quinn. To give this movie a bit of credit, it clearly did try when it comes to building its main cast of characters. The Canary Woman and the Detective, for example, are constructed in an adequate way where they have enough things about them for us to understand why 
what makes them tick and who they are as people. But despite this, we still never feel like we get close enough to them to actually be able to support and care about them. Because even though we are aware of the things that make them who they are, we never actually see those things take place. We just hear Harley say they took place. Ten years ago, she broke a career-making case. Camille's been singing at Roman's club for years. Remember the guy who stole her promotion? That's him. He calls her his little bird. The assistant DA? That's her ex. He's got her wrapped right around his fancy little finger. When Deadpool tells us things through voiceover, he tells them about himself as we see him experience them. What he doesn't do is tell us things about other unknown characters in an effort to make us care about them, but instead makes us care about them through the relationship he himself has with them. And so when Harley is randomly telling us stuff about these other main characters without having any kind of relationship with them herself, it just doesn't work and all these characters end up being is forgettable superficial sideshows. And even when we actually do see enough about a character's own story to kinda get close to them, it still gets ruined by the tone that comes with viewing this world from Harley Quinn's point of view, like happens with Huntress. Out of all the non-Harley protagonists in this movie, Huntress gets closest to functioning properly. We see the tragic event that molded her into who she is. We experience it with her. We actually feel for her and want to support her. But then out of nowhere, because this is a narrative told through the eyes of Harley Quinn, the movie suddenly takes this tragic backstory and turns it into a Harley-like carefree joke. What the hell is up with this bow and arrow stick? It's not a bow and arrow it's a crossbow i'm not 12. <laughs> i love this chick she's got rage issues. i don't have rage issues you know. So we have this really tragic backstory of this girl losing her entire family as a kid. And then ultimately all this world we exist in makes it amount to is, oh, your whole family was murdered? <laughs> I bet you have anger issues. And because this tragic backstory event is so different from the carefree ridiculous world of Harley Quinn to the point of being incompatible, it just ends up losing all of its emotional potency. Which is why even Mary Elizabeth Winstead, who is a great actor, just cannot make Huntress work. It's not a f***ing bow and arrow, it's a crossbow. I don't have rage issues! And the Oscar goes to... If you want to make a Deadpool-like Harley Quinn movie about Harley Quinn, then make a Deadpool-like Harley Quinn movie about Harley Quinn. But if you want to make a Deadpool-like Harley Quinn movie about this Birds of Prey crime-fighting group that Harley Quinn ultimately isn't even a member of, I would stop to reconsider. As much as what we've talked about causes problems all around the narrative and the protagonist characters, there is one aspect about this movie where it all works incredibly great. And that is our main villain, Roman Sionis. Sionis by far is the strongest part of this film, because none of the problems we've talked about apply to him. You know how we never got into the cast of main characters because we only hear Harley describe the things that make them who they are? Well, that doesn't happen with Sionis, because not only do we witness him experience experience events and make choices that clearly define who he is, we also get to know him through the relationship Harley has with him. Plus, unlike the other characters, he actually fits the tone of a Harley Quinn movie like a glove. He's a ridiculous carefree sadist who also seems to have a more three-dimensional deeper side to him, which is built up to with his overly insecure aggression as well as his strangely intimate relationship with his right-hand man, Zaz. Get out! Get out of here! You know that. I know it. Why doesn't this crossbow? Why don't I own the crossbow guy? You should own I it. I mean, I like crossbows. What is she laughing at? <laughs> is she laughing at me? Why is this happening to me? Why? I'm gonna get you diamond back. I promise. On top of all this, in the third act, Harley Quinn actually finally gets her own clear motivated goal when she has to race after Sionis to defeat him. And at this point, it's like, oh wow, this movie might actually end up being pretty good. Until... 
for an hour and a half, a core issue with this film has been that it tries to force a Harley Quinn movie out of a non-Harley Quinn movie. And now, at long last, when at the end it finally can be a full-on Harley Quinn movie, the filmmakers then suddenly decide that, hmm, maybe this shouldn't be a Harley Quinn movie. <laughs> Instead of Harley having a wonky end goal corresponding to her wonky personality, here she just wants to save this girl that nobody in the audience cares about. Which is fine, but way too much of a common cliché to be all there is to it. Instead of paying off the personality build-up done with Cyanus, here the ultimate reveal is that, yeah, the reason he wants the MacGuffin diamond is just to become rich and powerful. Which not only is like every B-class gangster movie ever, it also makes absolutely no sense. He's already been established to be the most dangerous guy in Gotham. The only person he fears is the Joker, who isn't even part of this movie. And so why would he need to become rich and powerful when that already is exactly what he is? If he gets the diamond, he'll have all the money and connections. To One of the most wealthiest families in Gotham. To bribe every single judge and cop he needs. Gotham's newest godfather to get a monopoly on the city. I own this town. And I'm telling you, it's so weird, because I swear they were building up for a climax that is something entirely else. And what do you know, asking my buddy Google, turns out something entirely else is exactly what it was supposed to be. In the original script, the MacGuffin diamond didn't contain codes to a bunch of money, but instead to a collection of nude photos of Cyanus that prove that he prefers sausage over pie. And it makes total sense. It explains why he's so weirdly intimate with Sass. It explains why he's so insecurely aggressive, it explains why he's causing all this mayhem and havoc for one diamond. Because underneath that scary danger shell, all he actually is is an insecure little man who's afraid people will see him for who he truly is. And that's freaking fantastic. Not only does it make this character three-dimensional, it also perfectly fits in this neon-colored wonky Deadpool-like Harley Quinn version of Gotham. Think about it. In the third act, Harley Quinn has to to defeat Black Mask by getting her hands on a bunch of nude photos that expose him for liking guys. And obviously, the point wouldn't be to convey there's something wrong with that but just to use it as an insecure flaw in the villain who refuses to grow over it. That's exactly the type of movie we've been trying to build up. That's exactly a Harley Quinn movie if I've ever heard of one. But instead, what we ultimately do get is Harley Quinn has to go save this girl from this rich powerful gangster who wants to become even more rich and powerful. And that's it. That's it. You know, at least Suicide Squad had the decency of being bad from start to finish to make it clear there exists no good version of it that we missed out on. But here, it's like, not only do they give you a movie that doesn't work, they also flip you off with the potential of what it could've been. So, sounds like good old DC.